Which is the bigger showstopper for a human Mars mission, food or radiation exposure? Does Vera Rubin leave any chance for aliens to sneak up on us? And can something like space whales actually exist? And in Q&A Plus, when can we find out what dark matter and dark energy actually are? All this and more in this question show. It's time for the question show. Your questions, my answers, as always, wherever you are, across my channel. If a question pops in your brain, just write it down. I'll gather them up and I will answer them here. All right, let's get into the questions. Casey Reem, what is the biggest showstopper for why we haven't been to Mars yet? Food or radiation? Both? Neither? I mean, the biggest showstopper for why we haven't gone to Mars is because it's ludicrously expensive. We would be looking at tens of billions, potentially a $100 billion to send a return mission to Mars. And, you know, people are proposing cheaper ways to do that. And like, great, by, by all means, demonstrate the cheaper ways to do that. But right now, for the kind of architecture that we can imagine, uh, it's going to cost you a ludicrous amount of money, and it requires technology that we just don't have. So an unwillingness to spend that much money on that kind of an endeavor is the problem right now. Uh, let's say we had people willing to spend that kind of money, then there's a whole bunch of issues that all come together at the same time. Food, not really, you send enough food with the astronauts so that they don't starve during the mission. Radiation, radiation is a problem, they're going to receive a much higher radiation load if they get caught in a solar storm, it's going to be a problem. Even when they're down on the surface of Mars, they're going to be exposed to radiation. So you're going to spend three years ish receiving a much higher like 200 times as much radiation as you experience down on the surface of Earth. That's a problem. Low gravity, uh, you know, we know that weightlessness is a problem Well, the astronauts are gonna to have to spend two nine month periods in weightlessness, as well as uh, either three months or 18 months on the surface of Mars in one third gravity. Um, so there's a bunch of issues that we just don't have locked in yet. And you know, anyone tells you that this is going to be easy is wrong. It's gonna be hard and expensive. And it's gonna require a lot of very careful planning to be able to pull this off. And so I am just by default skeptical, when anyone thinks that we're going to go and start setting up a city on Mars anytime soon, because there's just too much to do still. And nobody's willing to spend the money to do it. Richard Venice, does Vera Rubin make it impossible for an alien fleet to sneak up on Earth? If they try to come from something that's visible from the southern hemisphere. So Vera Rubin is located in Chile. And so it can see the South Pole of the sky, and then it can see through the equator. And I don't know exactly how far north it can see. But if the alien fleet came at us from the North Pole, then Vera Rubin wouldn't be able to see it. Ventsiv, if you could ask an advanced alien species one question, what would it be? I think I'd just like to know how they survived. Um, you know, when we think about all of the potential threats that we face right now, artificial intelligence, nuclear war, threats to the environment, threats from the environment, asteroids, potential bonkers science experiments. And we look out into the universe, and we don't see a lot of aliens out there. If we actually find the ones that survive, we like, how did you do it? So that we can prevent any of the bad things happening to us. That's what I would like to know. Terminally offline. Fraser, I love astronomy. And I want to work at a planetarium teaching others. How do I get into that career? What education or skills help the most? Getting work at a planetarium, or like any science center is a fairly achievable job. You know, we have the science world in Vancouver, as well as the planetarium in Vancouver. I've known people who've worked at both. Um, as well as I you know, I have friends who work at different museums and science centers around the world. Uh, one of the writers at Universe Today writes planetarium shows. So many of the shows that you've probably watched, she wrote them. Um, and so like, how do you do it? Um, so what's great is that you can get into the ground floor at a lot of these places, you can go and get a season's pass and come on a regular basis, that you can get to know the people that work with them. And a lot of them do various volunteer events, a lot of volunteer outreach, uh, where people come and set up telescopes or, uh, you know, open observing nights, like in Vancouver, we have the Atrium McMillan Planetarium. I don't know what its current name is, but you know it's the Space Center, and they have a telescope right beside the planetarium, and they do open nights where people come and just use the telescope. And it's it's a fairly big telescope. It looks great. And you know when you look at Mars, look at Saturn, and so on. And you, you know, a lot of the cases, these things are staffed by volunteers. So 
you know, you don't need to set up a tremendous long term career to be able to have an interesting role to play at a science center. Uh, you know, generally, an undergrad science degree will be what you would, would be really helpful, um, which can then be used for other things, right. Um, but I think, don't wait, contact your science center, your space center today. And let them know that you want to volunteer that you want to participate in various activities and what are some of the events that are coming up that you can be a part of and they will they will be glad to have your help because they're always understaffed that there are a lot of projects and a lot of education depends on these places and they don't have the people to help them do that and this is you make friends and you connect and you demonstrate your enthusiasm you get invited to larger and larger projects and eventually it becomes obvious that you're the person and you'll get a job offer i guarantee it um, so, you know, and, and then get involved in larger projects around your country, where you are participating in other big events of outreach and community and things like that. And eventually, inevitably, uh, you'll be tasked with responsibility and probably a salary. Steve Kennedy, what is the difference between a kilonova and a type 1a supernova? A kilonova is two neutron stars colliding with each other. A type 1a supernova is a white dwarf that has accumulated 1.4 times the mass of the sun and explodes. Technophile, do you think maybe we should quickly become a two planet species? Aside from climate change or asteroids, I'm mildly paranoid about nuclear doomsday. No use worrying about it, I guess. I don't think we should be we should quickly become a two planet species. I think we should do everything we can to minimize the chances of climate change causing a problem and nuclear apocalypse and all that kind of stuff. Um, and that we should work on becoming a solar system spanning civilization at whatever is the rate that it takes. You know, I think a lot of people set Mars as the goal, and then they want to do whatever it takes to accomplish Mars as the colony. But the problem is, is that we're too early on the tech curve for us to rush colony on Mars, it would make a lot more sense for us to just follow the tech curve, use, you know, develop different kinds of technologies for living and working in space and harvesting resources and creating more of a in situ resource utilization situation in space. And then finally, there will come a time when yeah, sure, uh, colonizing Mars is, is the obvious next thing. And the reality is, is that Mars is so terrible, that even if we just had the worst possible climate change on Earth, if we had a nuclear war, if an asteroid hit us, um, almost any disaster that we could imagine, it would the Earth would still be a 1000 times more habitable than Mars. And it's right here, it's under your feet. And you don't have to go anywhere to deal with that. So unfortunately, there's kind of like nothing we could do to make Earth worse than Mars. I mean, like, obviously, hold my beer, you know, someone's going to try. But yeah, so unfortunately, I, I, I just don't think it makes sense to rush that outcome. It's time to shout out all the new $5 patrons and above. David Norby, G. Sean Gourlay, Borat Klankar, Robert and Carol McEwen, Matt with one T, Harry at Zachtech, George Bissenden, Nomad Gunslinger, Rich Helzerman, and Terry Johnson. Join the club at patreon.com slash universe today. Michael D. How do you feel about the possibility of space whales type aliens? So people have proposed that you could have a life that exists in space itself. And there's a surprising science under this. So when you think about life, you know, we imagine that you need some kind of gravity environment that is providing the atmosphere that's providing the water that's cycling the environment, you know, the, the minerals and so on. But there was actually researchers that I interviewed about a year ago, where they were looking at could you have life exist just in the vacuum of space. And what they calculated was that if you were far enough away from the star, so you weren't getting a lot of radiation, that life could form a membrane in space. And it would then be able to bring water inside that membrane be able to have it become liquid because of the radiation coming from the sun. And that there's other resources that they would have available to them. And they could grow to fairly large sizes and to be able to be completely independent from a gravity well. And it was it blew my mind when I was talking with them about this because, um, you know, this is the thing that we expect, like we should be looking for life at planets. But what if we look for life 
just floating in space between planets. But it would probably not be, you know, the space amoeba from Star Trek. It would probably more be bacteria colonies surrounded by some kind of film that keeps them safe from space. Bobby 2112. How come on the USS Enterprise they're not floating around inside? They have gravity on the ship. How do they do that? Yeah, this is one of the things that tells you that that a science fiction show isn't taking the science very realistically because trying to explain how you get artificial gravity or having your astronauts float around having your your crew float around in in weightlessness is a pain to film. Um, and there have been shows that have done this. Uh, we think about the expanse, like they take gravity or a lack of gravity very seriously. Now they have come up with a fusion engine that allows their spacecraft to travel with like one G of acceleration. And then when the spacecraft is flying, then everybody experiences gravity and then the spacecraft turns around and then it decelerates at one G and everybody experiences gravity on the deceleration burn as well, which is awesome. Um, and then there's the times when they they aren't burning and they're in combat and they're everybody has to uh, sort of get into a seat and like tie themselves down and then be able to handle really extreme accelerations. It's so cool. So if you want to see a show that does this properly, the expanse is the absolute best. But they did this in Babylon five, where they had the human uh, spacecraft have giant rotating sections in them. And so part of the time people are in weightlessness and other parts people are in these. Uh, when they did the Martian, they had this giant rotating chunk of the spacecraft that people could be operating in. So it takes a little bit of creativity and um, uh, science to build that into your science fiction. And yeah, so like anything else, you watch any kind of a uh, science fiction show where they're on a spaceship and they're like, you know, how are they walking around on the surface of the ship? Who cares is their answer. It's easier this way and people aren't going to care and mostly people don't care. So I think that is fine, right? I don't worry too much about the liberties that science fiction takes. And that's a big one, right? And they describe it, you know, in Star Trek, they describe, you know, turn on the anti gravity inertial compensators and the gravitic hull plating or whatever they do, like just, just gobbledygook, uh, sciencey sounding words so that they can have people walk around in a set on Earth. And it looks like they're in gravity, right? That's all. Shoots 234. My summer astronomy class just started. And my professor says she loves black holes. Got any super interesting facts we could talk about in class? If you had a black hole with the mass of the entire observable universe, it would have an event horizon of the entire observable universe. See how she handles that one. Paul Wilson, if Betelgeuse goes nova, will we see it in the daytime sky? Yes. Uh, Betelgeuse, if it goes off, it's about 640 light years away, and it will be as bright as the full moon, but compressed down into a single point. Like if you had the full moon and Betelgeuse, you could remove the full moon, Betelgeuse would be casting that same amount of light. And of course, we can see the moon during the day, and we would be able to see Betelgeuse during the day. It would just be like this brighter star object in the sky all day long and we would be able to see it. Now it wouldn't last for long, it would last for a couple of months until it faded away. But yeah, it would be a, you know, when Betelgeuse goes off or any other close supernova, it will be a hell of a thing. Did you know that you can watch the same video with no ads and get a bonus question over on Patreon completely for free? We call that Q&A plus. And this week's bonus question, when will we find out what dark matter and dark energy actually are? And if you want to watch that episode, ad free, I'll put a link in the show notes. All right, those are all the questions that we had this week. Thank you everyone who asked your questions in the YouTube comments, everybody who asked your questions during the live show that we wrapped up two months ago. Uh, now I'm going to talk about the schedule. Uh, but first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Andrew Gross, Bradley Griffin, Brian Bodie, Caridwin, Chuck Hawkins, Commander Baylock, Cy Nelson, David Gilson, David Matz, Evan Pro, Hudson Ward, James Clark, Jeremy Mattern, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Marcel Smith, Michael Purcell, Monzo, Nick Borquez, Nick Solari, Paul Robach, 
Rin Kaidu, Richard Williams, Sean Sargent, Stephen Fowler Munley, Vlad Chiplin, and Wolfgang Klotz, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all our patrons. All your support means the universe to us. So we are now just a couple of days away for us returning to our regular schedule of live streams. So now the way this works is that we delay the release of the question show a week after we record the live question show, and that gives our editor time to pull together the questions. And so this is going to get weird, but the next live question show is going to be on Monday. September the 8th. So one week after the Labor Day weekend. And we're going to return to our regular schedule. So we'll start at five o'clock, go till seven o'clock. And then the next week, we will rotate to Europe. And then the week after that, we will rotate to Asian time. And so we will return to our regular normal schedule. And so I'm going to put the next event here on the channel. It's there right now. And so if you want to click on the notification to get a reminder of when we're going to do that, this is your way to do it. And then like I know it's rotating. I know it's complicated. But anyway, and then the actual question show will come out on the following Tuesday and Thursday. So that's how the schedule works. Uh, I can't wait to see you all again. All right. We'll see you next time.